Developers and welcome to the video. Today we're going to be going over The Daily Stoic by Ryan Holiday and Stephen Hanselman. 366 Meditations on Wisdom, Perseverance, and the Art of Living. Coming from some of the ancient Stoics such as Seneca, Epictetus, and Marcus Aurelius, as well as some lesser known Stoic philosophers. Nonetheless, the information is more applicable now today than ever. What I've done inside this mind map is taken my biggest ideas that I pulled out of the book. I've highlighted the two biggest ideas that I think are absolutely must read coming from the Daily Stoic in the brown color here. And with that, let's get directly into our introduction. The first passage that I pulled from the book to give us an overview of what we can expect goes like this. The private diaries of one of Rome's great emperors, the personal letters of one of Rome's best playwrights, and wisest power brokers, the lectures of a former slave in exile turned influential teacher. Against all odds, and the passing of some two millennia, these incredible documents survive. What do, what do they say? Could these ancient and obscure pages really contain anything relevant to modern life? The answer, as it turns out, is yes. They contain some of the greatest wisdom in the history of the world. Together, these documents constitute the bedrock of what is known as Stoicism, an ancient philosophy that was once the most popular civic disciplines in the West. Practiced by the rich and the impoverished, the powerful and the struggling alike in the pursuit of the good life. But over the centuries, knowledge of this way of thinking, once essential to so many, slowly faded from view. Our goal with this book is to restore Stoicism to its rightful place as a tool in the pursuit of self-mastery, perseverance, and wisdom. Something one uses to live a great life rather than some esoteric field of academic inquiry. Now this, Sto this first passage of the book made me think, why is Stoicism having such an amazing resurgence nowadays? You see online all the popular videos, all the popular books, some of Ryan's writing in particular is just so popular now. And I believe that it's because this philosophy that these ancient thinkers developed is really just super relevant to our modern life. They dealt with all the same stuff that we deal with today, but at that time they had much less distraction and potentially, arguably, they had more hardships. People are searching for a code to live by and something to help them find a purpose. That's exactly where Stoicism can fit in. Stoicism as a philosophy has been around for a millennia. It influenced some of the greatest thinkers in modern times. You could say that Thomas Jefferson, Ralph Waldo, well, Ralph Waldo Emerson, George Washington were all Stoics in their own right. So what are we going to learn today in this book, The Daily Stoic? Number one, we're going to learn how the Stoics dealt with worry and anxiety. We're going to understand how the Stoics found their purpose. Plus, we're going to, going to learn a whole lot more. What a great read. I really recommend that you pick this book up. Of all of Ryan Holiday's books, I think this is the one that you could open on any day of the week, any day of the month, and get a very impactful passage to help you through your day. A little bit about mind mapping before we move on. Get the most out of these mind maps by following along. Find the process of how I mind map, plus all 50 plus mind map templates, including this one, down at the link below. Following along with the mind maps helps you learn more, remember better, and apply these books to your life. Let's get into the passage that I pulled out about serenity. The single most important practice in Stoic philosophy is differentiating between what we can change and what we can't what we have influence over, and what we do not. A flight is delayed because of weather. No amount of yelling at an airline representative will end the storm. No amount of wishing you were <laughs> will make you taller or shorter or born in a different country. No matter how hard you try, you can't make someone like you. And on top of that, time spent hurling yourself at these immovable objects is time not spent on the things that we can change. The recovery community practices something called the serenity prayer. God grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Addicts cannot change the abuse suffered in childhood. They cannot undo the choices they have made or 
the hurt that they have caused. But they can change the future through the power that they have of the present moment. As Epictetus said, they control the choices that they make right now. The same is true for us today. If we can focus on making clear what parts of our day are within our control and what parts are not, we will not only be happier, we will have the distinct advantage over other people who fail to realize that they are fighting an unwinnable battle. Put your hand up if you sometimes feel like your day is just simply you fighting an unwinnable battle. How much time are you spending worrying about things that aren't inside your control? This is a great thing just to bring your awareness to during the day. What am I thinking about, right? What am I thinking about on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a minute by minute basis? Most of us will find that we're focusing on all sorts of things that we can't control. Perhaps we're spending time worrying about the stock market, what other people think, or if a business is going to get purchased. These are all outcomes that we aren't in full control of. What can you control in those situations, you might be asking? Well, you can learn how to manage your money better. You can spend time learning and developing knowledge, developing self-confidence and wisdom of self-confidence. And you can spend some time making your business more attractive. All of these things are active things that you can do in the moment. They're not going to necessarily change the outcome, but they might help you spend your time a little bit more wisely than worrying about what the outcome might be. Are you finding yourself struggling with worry or anxiety? Try out the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things that I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Not working? Well, this is almost, uh, this as almost all things in life, is really a practice. It's not a catch-all. It's not a complete band-aid for the problem of worry. But if you keep bringing your awareness back to the things in the moment that you can control, eventually it will get better and better at bringing yourself back there and you'll be less and less worried on a daily basis. Developing control over my focus was the most important thing that I've ever done. And I don't say that lightly. Years ago, I would focus on how many sales my business was or wasn't getting, how my body looked in the mirror or how people thought about me. All things that are obviously outside of my control. Now that I've been practicing for a few years, I try to focus on how many meetings I'm able to set, the food I'm eating, and the exercise I'm doing, and what I think about myself, not what others think about me. All of these things happen in the present moment and are not projected into the future. Are you struggling with anxiety or worry right now? Let me buy you a coaching session. Together we'll work on your ability to focus on what's in your control. Click the link below and apply. There's a limited number of coaching sessions available, and I want you to be able to get one if you're struggling with worry and anxiety right now. Our first main point of the mind map is about tranquility, and the passage goes like this. In Seneca's essay on tranquility, he uses the Greek word, euthymia, which he defines as believing in yourself and trusting you are on the right path, and not being in doubt by following the myriad footpaths of those wandering in every direction. It is a, in this state of mind, he says, that produces tranquility. Now again, people could be nodding their heads along with me, wandering in every direction. I sometimes felt like that in my life, absolutely. Clarity of vision allows us to have this belief that that's not to say that we're always going to be 100% certain of everything, or that we really even should be. Rather, it's that we can rest assured that we're heading generally in the right direction, that we don't need the, to constantly compare ourselves with other people or to change our mind every three seconds based on new information. Instead, tranquility and peace are found in identifying our path and sticking to it, staying the course, making adjustments here and there naturally, but ignoring the distracting sirens who beckon us towards the rocks. How often are you worried if you're on the right path or not? If you're anything like me, it's all the time. When I first got into entrepreneurship, I would skip from marketing plan to marketing plan, from pricing to pricing, and everything in between. This caused all sorts of havoc in my business, for sure. My business wasn't growing as quickly as it could. My uh, sales staff were not having as good a time as they could have been having as employees. 
But really what was happening is it was being caused by an even deeper havoc that was actually going on inside of me. You've heard the phrase that your internal reality is creating your external reality, and that was certainly the case for me at this time. Because I was always trying to follow what I saw those around me doing, I was copying my peers or my mentors, and I was never really doing my own thing, and I never really felt like I was following my own path. This meant that even when something worked, it wasn't really fulfilling to me because it was simply a strategy that I employed that was someone else's. But it also meant, sneakily, that when something failed, it wasn't my fault. It was actually someone else's. See, by taking someone else's path in life, we abdicate our responsibility of outcome to them. And this saves us the potential of failing, but it also means that we never follow our own true path in life or in business. And this is something that almost all of my coaching clients deal with. Me as a coach, I have to be very careful not to lay the path out in front of someone. And instead, I have to question and I have to help them shine the light on their own path. One particular time, a young man joined me on a call and he began to tell me about all the different businesses that he had tried. One after another, I noticed that they were all plans that other people had told him to follow. And side note, he would never follow the plan for very long, certainly not until it had been fulfilled. He would follow it for a month or two here, half a year there. This guy had spent thousands of dollars on how-to guides for businesses. Never once did he ask himself, what do I want to see in the world? And this was causing him to take a bunch of non-continuous paths, meaning he never made any progress. If you have a hundred steps to take, and you take 10 steps in every different direction, you end back where you were before. Much better to create a continuous path where you can take 100 steps forward. Together with this young man, we worked together on a vision for his life and what he wanted to create in the world. The good news was that he had a lot of experience to grow on. He was very experienced at starting businesses, at knowing what he didn't want to do. But we needed to focus his attention and ignore the paths of others. And that's including the path that I set out in front of him. It was mostly a relationship of me questioning some of the beliefs that he was currently holding. The next point we're going to talk about is don't care. One of the most powerful things that you can do as a human being is our, in our hyper-connected 24-7 media world is say that I don't know or more, more provocatively that I don't care. Most of society seems to have taken it as a commandment that one must know every single current event. Watch every episode of every critically acclaimed television series, follow the news religiously, and present themselves to others as an informed and worldly individual. But where is the evidence that this is actually necessary? Is the obligation enforced by the police? Or is it that you're afraid of seeming silly at a dinner party? Yes, you owe it to your country and your family to know generally about the events that may directly affect them, but that's about all. How much more time, energy, and pure brain power would you have available if you were drastically cut your media consumption? How much more rested and present would you feel if you were no longer excited or outraged by every scandal, breaking story, and potential crisis, many of which never come to pass anyway? Such a deep and insightful and meaningful point. And it's very interesting that this has come from Stoic philosophy when they had not a quarter, not a tenth, not a hundredth of the amount of media and connectedness that we have today. When was the last time, I want you to think about this, when was the last time that you went a full day without consuming any kind of media? For most of us, I'm guessing that the answer is that we haven't done it since our childhood. Gone are the days where we would spend all day outside with our friends, playing from dawn until dusk, only to go home tired and ready for a rest. But aren't these days what we're truly longing for? Wasn't this when we were truly at our happiest? Instead, most of us adults, me included, tend to consume the news, television, and even self-development articles or videos every single free minute that we have, meaning we're never actually in silence or boredom. Lately, I've been really noticing the power of boredom and the power of play, two very important cornerstones to my life now. 
Instead of reading an article or watching a TV show after dinner, I would rather sit and be bored, in complete silence, watching what my mind comes up with. Is it coming up with business ideas? Is it coming up with, uh, you know, it could be coming up with what's going on out there. It could just be telling me how bored I am. There's a lot of things that your mind does when it gets bored. Or I'll set aside some time with my girlfriend just to talk, come up with ideas, or even play a board game. That's what our minds are really craving. Now, I'm no monk. It's very difficult to cut out all media. In fact, we're on media right now, so I, I don't suggest that you cut off all media. But I do want you to give something a try. A little exercise that I give to some of my coaching clients and an experiment that I'm going to be running on myself. Join me in No Tech Sundays. Every Sunday, there's no tech allowed. No TV, no phone, not even for maps, and no computer. Here's the catch. Every Sunday, you must do something fun with other people. Go for a hike, meet for breakfast, or go to an event. But you have to plan it in advance so you know what time, where, and who is going. This does a few things. Number one, it shows you that you need to spend time planning for play and for fun in your life. Number two, it allows you to get lost sometimes. If you're going for a hike in a new place or you're going to a new restaurant that you don't know the location of, it's very interesting to try and navigate the world as it would have been before smartphones were a thing. I really suggest you do it. It's been a ton of fun the few weekends that I've been doing it here, and a lot of the coaching clients that I've suggested this to just in the past couple of weeks have told me how much fun they had on their no-tech Sundays. The next point we're going to be talking about is boxing. Something very near and dear to my heart is fighting and combat sports. The Stoics used to love boxing and wrestling metaphors, the way that we use baseball and football analogies today. This is probably because the sport of pancreation literally means all strength, but a pure form of mixed martial arts than one sees today in the UFC was, an integral, was integral to boyhood and manhood in Greece and Rome. In fact, recent analysis has found instances of cauliflower ear, a common grappling injury on Greek statues. The Stoics refer to fighting because it's what they knew. Seneca writes that unbruised prosperity is weak and easy to defeat in the ring. But a man who has been at a constant feud with misfortunes acquires a skin calloused by suffering. This man, he says, fights all the way to the ground and never gives up. That's what Epictetus means too. What kind of boxer are you if you leave because you get hit? That's the nature of the sport. Is that going to stop you from continuing? And a little question to add on to that, are you afraid to fight? Now, this doesn't have to be in combat sports, but are you afraid to fight for your business? Are you afraid to fight for your career? Are you afraid to fight for your relationships? When I was 16, I was terrified of fighting. This is real, real fighting, fist-to-fist -fist combat. But some of the best life lessons that I've ever learned came from my time as a boxer. Every weekend, for five years, I would have a fight. It was a sparring match, but we used to try and take each other's heads off every weekend. This is happening whether I was hurt, tired, or scared. In fact, sometimes we would run hill sprints before we would do our sparring, just to make it all the more difficult. Eventually, I became a Golden Gloves champion in my country, all while being terrified of fighting, and being hurt and tired and scared. So what were some of the lessons that I learned during that period as a boxer? The number one lesson is that you're much tougher than you think. Most people never test their boundaries, and it's a real shame. I never thought that I could do uh, what I have done with boxing. I never thought I could be a Golden Gloves champion. I never thought I could win a single fight until I actually got in there into the arena and tried. Number two is that the most important part of fighting isn't actually being able to punch hard. It's about being willing to be punched and keep coming back. I've seen a lot of guys when they first got into the ring, they got hit in the head for the first time, and that was it. They had given up. Didn't matter if they were powerful and skilled, they weren't willing to continue to keep coming back. Number three is that when you're in the ring, you can't focus on anything else. Because if you do, you're going to immediately pay for it. If you're focusing on who's in the crowd, focusing on what you're going to do later, or focusing on something other than yourself, you're going to pay for it. 
You have to be intensely focused on the task at hand. And how might this relate to your life? I'm no longer a boxer. How have I brought these teachings of boxing and combat sports into fruition in my life right now? Well, when you're reading and you're, you're going to give up on studying a business idea or a career, just remember that you are tougher than you think. You can study a little longer. You can continue down this path of business and entrepreneurship or a career choice a little bit more. And that's the true with exercise as well. Are you suffering from a failure? Did your business collapse? Did you get uh, demoted or did you get fired? Just remember, champions are made from those of us who are willing to get back up. The final point is focus intensely on the task at hand. Let everything else drop to the side lest you be blindsided and pay for it immediately. Focus, so, so important. The next point that we're going to talk about is about two different tasks. The quote goes like this. You have two essential tasks in life, to be a good person and to pursue the occupation that you love. Everything else is a waste of energy and a squandering of your potential. So how does one do that? Okay, that's a tougher question. But the philosophy that we see the Stoics make, it's simple enough. Say no to distractions, to destructive emotions, to outside pressure. And instead, ask yourself, what, it, was it, what is it that only I can do? What is the best use of my limited time on this planet? Try to do the right thing when the situation calls for it. Treat other people the way that you would hope to be treated. And understand that every small choice and tiny matter is an opportunity to practice these larger principles. That's it. That's what goes into the most important skill of all. How to live. Are you not sure what to focus on? Are you feeling lost in life? These two tasks that you have are the most important. Two essential tasks that if you start... You really need to only focus on them and your life will get measurably better. Number one is to be a good person. And it's number one for a reason. Try to do the right thing when the situation calls for it, even when it might be the harder route. Treat other people how you hope to be treated. The true golden rule of every single philosophy. Now, these both seem simple in theory, but they're difficult in practice and they take a lot of practice to get right. Number two, find the occupation that you love. Entrepreneurship is getting more and more common in our society. I think that most of us can create an occupation that we love. After all, back in the day of the Stoics, most people were entrepreneurs. People forget that in history, there weren't any factories or corporations. You had to put food on the table for yourself. Think what you might want to, think that you might want to turn something you love into an occupation, whether that's a career or an entrepreneurial endeavor. I've been an entrepreneur for literally my whole adult life. Two, hopefully three, successful companies in two completely different areas. Let's talk about your plan. I would love to help. Entrepreneurship is a huge passion of mine. I love getting on coaching calls with people that are looking to be entrepreneurs or are already entrepreneurs and looking to dimensionalize their business. Sign up for that free coaching call down below. I promise to help you get some clarity and direction. Again, those are a limited number of coaching calls. So if you're looking to grow your business, looking to start a business, looking to get some inspiration for what type of business you might want to get into, I recommend that you click that link down below. And our final point from the Daily Stoic, Ryan Holiday and Stephen Hanselman is Amor Fati. Something happened that we wish had not. Which of these is easiest to change? Our opinion or the event that is past? The answer is obvious. Accept what happened and change your wish that it had not happened. Stoicism calls this the art of acquiescence, to accept rather than to fight every little thing. And the most practiced Stoics take it a step further. Instead of simply accepting what happens, they urge us to actually enjoy what is happening, whatever it is. Nietzsche, many centuries later, coined the perfect expression to capture this idea. Amor fati, a love of fate. It's not just accepting, 
is loving everything that happens. To wish for what has happened to happen is a cle- happen to happen is a clever way to avoid disappointment, because not nothing is contrary to your desires, but to actually feel gratitude for what happens, to love it. That's a recipe for happiness and joy. When something goes wrong in your life, as many of the examples that we've given before, things happen. When something goes wrong, what do you say? Well, Jocko Willink, whose books I've done reviews for on this channel, I recommend that you check them out if you're interested in Stoicism. I think Jocko is a very Stoic writer as well, even though he's a modern writer. Jocko, I think, has a very Stoic take on this particular point. He says that when something goes wrong, you say, good. Didn't get enough sleep? Good. Now's a chance for me to test how I perform when tired. Hungry? Good. This hunger is going to help me train my willpower. Didn't get the promotion? Good. Now is the time for me to focus on my side business. This is a reflex that I suggest all of my clients and my video viewers develop. One woman I spoke to yesterday, and this was actually just yesterday, was complaining about some of the hardships she had in her business. People here don't support local businesses. I can't find any networking events, and I haven't been able to get any referrals. She had a million different excuses as to why her business wasn't growing. Together we looked at how she could say good to each one of these different scenarios. Number one, people don't support local, she said. Well, that means that no one else has my market share. I can take a large portion of the local market even quicker if I can figure out how to get people to support me. Number two, I can't find any networking events, and I haven't been getting referrals, she said. Good. That means that I can be the leader of a networking group. The secret to those things is the leader always gets all the referrals anyways. Are you struggling with something right now? How might you say good to that problem? Or in the words of the Stoics, how might you say amor fati? Thanks for being with me here today. This was The Daily Stoic by Ryan Holiday, Stephen Hanselman, and I'm Ethan. I'm the Mind Map Guy, and I hope to see you in the next video.